Welcome back to the Fear and Beer Podcast, where we discuss all things Halloween Horror Nights, horror movies, and just a little bit of beer. So kill the lights, grab a cold one, and join us as we dive into this mad world we love. I'm Nick. I'm Seamus. And I'm Jamie. Like scary movies. Uh huh. Here's Johnny. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. You miss me. Aren't you drinking? I never drink. Why? And as a reminder to all listening, if you want to help us to continue growing as a podcast, don't forget to leave us a five-star review on whichever streaming platform you use. To stay up to date with us and all of our episodes, be sure to follow all of our socials. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Fear and Beer Pod. Feel free to reach out to us. We love to interact with you all. And here we are yet again, another day into our one week until HHN Podathon, and we are so close. We are down to the last three days. It is crazy. I believe tonight is team member preview night. If I'm lining up my, nope, that's tomorrow. Eh, these days get pretty jumbled up, but um, that's how close we are to actually being in the fog. So we have a very special episode. We figured Insidious is going to be at HHN. We might as well dive into the franchise a little bit because this is something we, we've kind of been pushing off a little bit. We, we've known of Insidious for a while and we've kind of just put it on the back burner. So it's time to actually talk this whole franchise. So I'm joined with Jamie today. Seamus is MIA because he's stuck in the further right now. Uh, we'll see if we can pull him back out for, for the next couple days or something like that. But either way, um, we have Jordana joining us today from, you'll know her from Pretty Killer Podcast, but she's also a part mm-hmm. of Core 4 Pod and the mm-hmm. Feature Creature DTF. So Jordana, welcome to the Fear and Beer. Thank you for having me, guys. I am so excited to be here. Yes. Yeah, something we've kind of been talking about and Mm -hmm. trying to line up for a little bit, but it's just everybody is so crazy. And we think we're busy. You have three podcasts that you're a part of, so I don't- (laughs) You are very busy. (laughs) Why don't you just- Take take the time real quick and just let everybody that may not be familiar with you, um, if you're not, I don't know where you've been hiding, but just let them know where (laughs) to find you and exactly what you're doing on all these different podcasts. Oh my God. I don't even know what the hell I'm doing most of the time, but (laughs) Um, join the club. I know. and It's great though, because I I love the dynamic of each one that I'm in because it's, it's so different, but it feels like family in a sense. But Mm -hmm. I mean, mine is just me rambling about horror, terrifier, Halloween jaws on repeat pretty Mm -hmm. much. And then the core four pod is just a mix of, amazingness mark mark loves horror macabre maddie podcast killing time aubrey and then i got sam for uh, feature creature ctf and all of those uh accounts instagram tiktok every social media platform pretty much you could find us so yes it is very tough staying up with all these different social medias because I just I've kind of given up on focusing on all of them and, and really honed in on like Instagram because I just that that's the easiest one for me to gravitate towards. So it's I like Instagram. I like tough. Instagram too. And mm-hmm. I feel like it's it's an easy platform to like navigate. Uh, TikTok took me a while to like kind of find my groove. That's my thing. Nick's the TikTok guy. Yeah. Bare- <laughs> barely. That's a have- very like you're giving me a lot of credit there. That's right. I, I make there's stupid like no rhyme memes. or reason. You know yeah. what I mean? Like no, it's, it's hit or miss sometimes, but yeah. mm-hmm. make a yeah. funny meme. There's three views. You film the Megan's dancing, you get 25,000 views. I don't know. Right. I can't figure it out. <laughs> um, and then we got demure. So like we just need uh, to look up <laughs> random words in the dictionary that we can make popular and then literally we'll viral, so. <laughs> yeah. Can, can't keep track of these kids these days. That's for sure. So, mm-hmm. uh before we dive in through the Insidious franchise, we're going to we're going to do a little walkthrough and then we're going to give you our rankings. But let's talk a little HHN before we get into that, because obviously that's the reason why we're all here. So, Jordan, what's your like history with HHN? I know you're coming down this year. Mm-hmm. Is there like a specific time that you remember that got you into Horror Nights or is there like a favorite house of yours? What's your history with HHN? Oh man, my love for HHN. I So I was born in Orlando and I lived there until like, yeah, early 90s. And it makes me okay. sad now that I don't live there because it would be so cool to be in a community with like you guys and like have p- people in person that share the same, you know, love for HHN. But like I I wanted to go the first HHN when it was just like the one house, you know, yeah, and then. Nights. Yes. And then uh, I think it was like the second year or third. They did the Jaws ride at night. And 
I was like, I'm going because my mom, she worked at Disney. So we were either at like Disney or Universal pretty much every single weekend as a kid. So that was my happy place. So my grandmother shot that shit right down. She's like, absolutely not. You're not going to, you're not doing that. And my HHN dreams were shattered. So fast forward to uh, when Greg and I got married, we were debating honeymoons and he wanted a beach vacation. He wanted to do nothing. I'm like, bitch, we're going to HHN. Like we're going to <laughs> Universal. And uh, that year, and I'm sorry if I ramble, but that year it was no call, Hall- yeah. mm-hmm. Halloween 2. Uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is Greg's favorite movie. And then Halloween 2, obviously, is my jam. Yes. Uh, Exorcist, which I'm rocking the exor- the Ooh. shirt tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, Krampus, American Horror Story. So it was like we cried. Very good home. year. Yes, it was an amazing year. Yeah. Um, so- and it's kind of cool, like a full circle moment, because we were there when the Dead Man's Pier was a scare zone. Yeah. So and that then- must have been, was, is that 26? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. 2016. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that was an experience. He's like, I'm, and we were wasted. I mean, like we pounded, we pounded a beer at Monster Cafe and ate a huge slice of pizza. And we're like, let's go ride the mummy. We had no idea what that was. And I will literally send the picture afterwards. I, I like died on that ride because I didn't know what it was. And we were just like. <laughs> it's even better when you don't know what it is going into a blind. Yes. And it's my mm-hmm. favorite ride. Like, I love that ride now but so then we did that and then um we just went with our daughter in 2022 and we got to do the halloween house and so it was like and then the dead man's pier ha- like the actual house so i feel like it was kind of like a full circle moment in the times mm-hmm. that we've went and experienced it so i love hhn it's it is nice getting to see like yeah and getting to see like prequels and like sequels to like houses and scares and it's always really fun too when you get to see both iterations of it yeah and like that scare mm-hmm. zone was like there's pictures of me just every, like from every angle they were coming. And it was cool because I kind of felt like it was fog esque. Shout out John Carpenter because yep. I, I want like a, a year of John Carpenter for houses. I want the thing, the Ugh, fog, Christine. <laughs> like how awesome would that be? Yes, definitely. So that's like, that's my history with HHN. And I hope that we can do this more often. Ro- Roz was a champ. She walked through every single house, was not bothered. Oh, I wish I was more like that as a kid. When I was a kid, I was terrified. My dad was like, yeah, we're never coming back here again. <laughs> Didn't want to do any of the houses except for a couple. It was just, I was very picky about it. And I was like, maybe I could do this one. Some of the others I was like, eh. But now as I'm older, I was like, man, I should have just, I should have just done them. I know. <laughs> now and I like, would do anything. That's how I was with the Jaws ride. I wouldn't want to, I was like, I get in line and then I'd get scared. My mom's like, just we waited a half an hour. Get up, fucking It ride. was scary. <laughs> Yeah. And I had my little King Kong plushie mm-hmm. and when the end, remember when like he was burnt and then he came back up? Yes. Yeah. Like at the end, I fucking <laughs> chucked that thing and my mom's just staring at me and I'm like, oh. Sitting at the bottom of the Universal Lagoon. Yes. Rest in peace. Gone King forever. Kong. Man. I, and that's the other thing too. They need to make a park with all the old rides so we can have that nostalgic feeling. Back to the Future ride. I miss well, that's the crazy part because they, they had all these classic rides and you know, come and gone. And now they're like, Oh yeah. Um, remember all those really good properties and rides? Uh, we'll just make a parade out of it because we know that's what you want. It's like, bitch, you shouldn't have taken them away in the first place. Like I Agreed. get it. Harry Potter sort of trumps the jaws area and that probably pulls in a lot more money, but mm-hmm. like, come on. Like, I, I just want to go to MD Island real quick. I want to drink an Narragansett with Quinn. Like just give me People what I live want. for the nostalgia. Yeah. yeah it's definitely I'm one of them. And I'm one of them. <laughs> I'm the same way. We're doing uh, pictures with Angel this year. Actually, we're getting a. F- we've never had. I a saw that. I told Nick that. Yep. Yes, we've never yes. had pictures done, and I'm like, you know what? We're gonna She's do awesome. pictures. I love her, mm-hmm. and like I don't, I've never met her. I cannot wait to actually physically meet her this year. She's very sweet. I love her. Yeah, so she's, she's amazing. Yes. yes. And it's but. just so funny, like that. You were saying full circle. It's just so funny, even like people like that. Like it all comes together. That's so funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, it is like, a very. Small community, even though how big it is, it's like you yeah. still know. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and and I just love it. I I think it's 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 such a great community, and I just feel like welcome. Like even with the horror realm, it all intertwines, but it's just such a a fun place to be. And I would mm-hmm. be no other place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what do you think about uh, this year for HHN? Are you excited? Or like, where do you stand? Like the whole IP versus original thing. What what's got you really intrigued about this year's event? So I'm usually like an original gal. I really like the original IPs because I think just having, 
a different story and not knowing what we're getting into. I mean, like we get the general gist of what's happening, but to see that story play out, I really, I love that. Um, and the, the IPs this year, like I'm excited about a quiet place too. I will admit I was trash talking it. I'm like, if we get that, it's going <laughs> to be too. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be so stupid. And now after watching the movie, I'm kind of excited for like a creature feature house mm-hmm. and see what they come yep. up with because I'm really bummed. We missed American werewolf in London when that was there. Yeah. Yeah. And so. I, you said you were there for the Halloween house. So were you there with 31? Did you see the major sweets candy? Um, the scare zone? Yes, I did. Yeah. So nice. that'd be cool too. Seeing that, is that cool. like your yeah. second yeah. sort of scare zone turned house. And I'm happy it's that one because that was Rosalind's fave. Like she loved it and thought it was so cool. And I, I just loved the old music playing it. it brought you back it was and classic like, halloween yes it made it felt like that and um that's awesome that it's an original but i'm also excited excited for the uh blumhouse scare zone mm, yep jamie's Season all about that one. very excited yeah, I, it'll I be fun it. to see those characters in the streets absolutely i kind of and i know that i said it on one of the posts but i really wish that we would get a peach fuzz um something From like creep a, yes Yep. How awesome. Or like Mark Duplass or someone just being naked, like in Creep Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. That's what I'm, that's see if what I'm get hoping for, I, I too. Can, I, can't, I can't see why not. <laughs> right. I hope we get some more like diverse characters that we don't get to see as often, like at the event. Like we were saying in other mm-hmm. episodes, we've done like the people from The Purge and like the Megans and like stuff like that. But I like like kind of like the one-off characters, too. I'm really hoping we get Bagul. I'm still, yes. still hoping. So <laughs> he's just so easy to do a character design. He'd be so creepy. And I don't know why they wouldn't want to go down the avenue. Or also, too, I, I know there was a lot of backlash with the Five Nights at Freddy's because people were like, why has that yeah. not been a thing? So, and mm-hmm. I was not, I'm, I was expecting it. I thought that was going to be a house. I really was, too. Unfortunately. Mar- I'm, I'm going to keep calling it as a house until it's not there, until it's there. I did, I'll just I keep so saying too. every year it's going to be coming. Like, that's just, it's, it's I can't imagine that they don't have even a sprinkle of Five Nights at Freddy's somewhere in the park. Like, Mm-hmm. I just until the event happens and he's not there, I'm still not sold that it's going to be a completely Freddy free event. Mm-hmm. Agreed, but maybe they're like saving it for the sequel because I know that we're getting a sequel, right? That's yes. what oh, I was yeah. thinking oh, yeah. too. That's a money maker. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. They're going to be playing that thing until the if they do like a part out. one and two or something. That would be yeah. nice. And, so, and I'm not, sure like they will. the Ghostbusters house, I wasn't a fan of the Fro- of Frozen Empire. Like the movie, mm-hmm. it just felt like there was so much thrown at you and compared to afterlife like that's apples and oranges because afterlife i don't know how you guys feel about afterlife but that movie like it hit me right here because ghostbusters the is so like yep it's nick likes afterlife i think you like that one i I loved that i loved afterlife i really (laughs) liked it yeah i was i was crying in the movie theater like i love that movie (laughs) when harold ramus's ghost came up i was like oh fuck don't look at me that was sad I can't even talk about it because I will tear up. But when that moment happens, he grabs her fucking hand. Oh, my God. And they're all staring at him. I was sobbing. Like, I, all of us watched it together. And we were audibly, like, tissues, like, snot I coming out. I looked at Nick, like, side-eyed. And I was like, I'm going to let him be. Yeah. <laughs> let him have his moment. Just let me have my moment. Yes. No, I thought I, it was beautiful. Yeah. I did, And I loved the story, too. Like, I felt like podcast, the Paul Rudd, and even, like, the – fan service that we did get i didn't think it was overkill i thought it was done in such a great way and then we get frozen empire and i yeah i didn't i didn't really like care for it that much but i'm excited to see what we're gonna get in the house yeah that one fell short for me as well it just felt i think i just said it on another episode on maybe catacombs but it just felt like it was too convenient at points Mm -hmm. like podcast was no there was no real reason for him to just suddenly be in New York, as well as like the the other friend, the the girl that was like, oh, I'm on a summer internship, but I didn't tell anybody <laughs> that I was in town. Like, it just yes. I'm just randomly just had to shoehorn them in there. Yeah, like, I, and they're from the middle of nowhere. There, it was where it was like Idaho or Indiana or some like somewhere absolute yeah. nowhere, flyover yeah. state. And I can't. I work two jobs, and I can't afford to go to New York City. So I don't know how the hell these teenagers are just randomly showing up in New York City. Yeah. So yeah, no, Very it's strange. Yeah. It's insane, <laughs> but um, let's let's get into Insidious. Let's get into the the meat mm-hmm. and potatoes of this franchise because there's a lot going mm-hmm. on, and we have no idea 
really what's in this house. You know, it's just called The Further. So we don't know if it's really like in an original interpretation of this franchise as a whole. We don't know if it's just The Further and like a sort of best hits kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe it follows the Dalton storyline and kind of dismisses the other uh, four and five in the franchise or three and four in the franchise. So, Mm -hmm. so I'm curious. So let's, we'll go through the franchise for anybody that's maybe not as familiar. And again, I'm glad we're doing this because myself, I I've been watching the franchise in all random orders and they do intertwine with one another. So it does get a little murky when it comes to the timeline and Mm -hmm. you know, what was in what movie, you know, thankfully each movie kind of has its own distinct, like um, villain. It kind of, they break it up that way a little bit, but it does Mm -hmm. get a little confusing. The fact that, you know, and there's of course, of course there's going to be plenty of spoilers in this episode, but um, you know, Lorraine or, um, well, I can't even, I'm blanking already. Um, Lor- yeah. It's not Lo- Elise. Elise. I keep saying Lor- Elise. Lorraine is Josh's I keep mom. But- call La- I know. I keep wanting to call her Lorraine too when I was writing. Yeah. But um, know, Elise, like night. she's in all of them, but she died in the first movie. Like it's just, it's, it ties in weirdly. So let's, let's kind of go through the franchise movie by movie. Um, and Jordan, I'll kick it over to you. Cause I know you just, yes. you love these OG movies and one and two definitely tie together the most out of the franchise as a whole. So if you could just kind of walk us through those a little bit and then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll carry on through the franchise. Absolutely. So the Lambert family, they, a great, you know, American family. And you think it's going to be like a haunted house type style movie. And you find out that it's not the house. It's a, it's a family affair when it comes to these hauntings, you know, and without like giving too much away, like obviously Josh's past plays a part. And then we learn about the further and astral projection, which I'm kind of happy that James Wan put that in there and gave us like another added element to like a paranormal dynamic, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then I, I have to, I got to find it real quick. I wanted to read the description just because I literally laughed out loud when I looked up and <laughs> yes, because and I know, let me find it. Okay. The description parents take drastic measures when it seems their new home is haunted and their comatose son is possessed by a lovely entity. <laughs> <laughs> like when I saw that I was, and I know com- comatose obviously, but like, yeah, you're like it just, well, why, why would like, you put comatose? Just like he's in coma, not comatose. Like that's me yeah, on a normal night. Very different. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Drastically different. <laughs> completely different so so then we like so josh is in a coma don't know how that happened and then it just progresses into this like into the further and we get elise and she has history with the family we have the red the lipstick demon Mm -hmm. that is the main antagonist of this movie um and it's just like they're their journey in moving all over the place thinking it's the house but it's actually the people that are being possessed. So that's, I mean, mean, this, yeah, I say this one does have that all timer jump scare that like, I think statistically has like the heart rate raised the most when you see the first lipstick demon visual behind Josh in full daytime, which is kind of breaking the rules of horror that that's how it catches you off guard the most. Um, So I, that's really the iconic image from this film and what, I think without the the fame from that shot and that scare, it's, the franchise probably still would have succeeded, but that was just such a big shining moment that helped project this from a standalone into a whole franchise. Absolutely. And you know what? Like we watched this in theaters and it was packed because we went opening weekend, uh, like 2011, I think it's when it came out. And the amount like that was the best time I had in the theater too because think of all of the amazing like jump scares and scenes like the whole um uh nighttime scene where they're in bed and the door with the alarm Mm -hmm. and the back and forth Uh, yeah it's one of my favorite scenes that whole sequence is so good it's chef's kiss it's so good and it literally my heart was beating out of my chest and then you get the Mm -hmm. the image behind the the baby's crib yeah, the guy. Me, the, it still gets me every single time. We we were watching it last night, and I was like, oh. yeah, like <laughs> I know, I know I it's coming. We've seen this a hundred times. I forget it comes up so quick. 
but it's so subtle because like there's so many shots where like they turn it and it's, a, it's still like a movement and you think mm-hmm. oh it's not this part it's later on and then it happens and you're like oh shit like it's so good i i just feel like it is good he james wan really took it there and i i for for me i felt like it was just kind of like a game changer in the paranormal movie realm um so so yeah so then the ending is is quite um I guess like, I don't want to say open-ended, but everything happens. And then we roll into two mm-hmm. and with two, I don't, I hope you don't mind if I just roll into. No. Yeah. Two. Cause that's Go the ahead. perfect side like, that they yes. do tie okay. right. One, two together. So it's mm-hmm. perfect. Yes. So then, you know, they move again and they think that all their problems are gone. Uh, but like Elise dies and no one seems to know how the fuck she died because <laughs> <laughs> like well, everyone was Josh in the, house was in the room, but it. we don't think it's Josh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the line. Well, your husband, the, the, the DNA came back. It's not your husband, but you know, we're still, however you worded it. it's like, right. Investigating or whatever. You're like, who else is it going to be then? (laughs) Thank you. And if I were her, if I was Renee, I would be like, no, I need to know who the fuck killed her in my house. It's like, what what is going on? In my living room. (laughs) And that would also like make me super suspicious of my husband. Like if Patrick Wilson was my husband and like mm-hmm. he was in the room at the at the time of a murder and then nothing can be explained, I'd be like, well, I'm going to go stay at a hotel and I hope that you have a great life. And <laughs> yeah. So, but like, I love how two kind of dives deeper into like past stories and Josh's, like, I, I kind of want to say like his origin story because we focused on Dalton and what was currently going on. And yes, we got parts of what had happened in Josh's past, but like this one, I love that it's geared towards that and then like marrying it all together. Mm-hmm. So uh, to, I, I don't know. Like I love to, I just recently watched it today, but there's just, I don't know. There's just some yeah, things about it that, you know, it's like, shot not like very reflex, weird. Yes. It was like aged pretty poorly, I think, from just from when it was filmed in comparison to like the other ones. You know, the uh, effects are a little bit hit or miss, but I, I really enjoyed second one. It, it just yes. the whole kind of not real introduction, but like when you see the bride in black at the end, when when um, Elise takes the picture and you're like, oh, yes. shit. And mm-hmm. I was like, OK, I hope we get a little bit more insight. And then thankfully we didn't have to wait too long because this thing was a moneymaker. So they just here you go. Take it. Yep. Um you know, we did dive deeper into to Josh and stuff like that. And that's, I kind of liked that whole, he's possessed, but like, it's a tricky way to find out. And I think I said, or I saw in an interview that James Wan told Renee, or I, I believe her name's like Rose or a- the actress, whatever it was, but the actress yeah. to, to act as if you think Josh is cheating on you, not as if like you think he's possessed. So like have that intention of like, you, you you, just, you know something's like, up, but yeah, mm-hmm. you're not assuming he's a murderer. You think he's kind of cheating on you, uh, which, which I is, think when you look back, it works. Yeah, it does. It, it, you know, I was just going to say it does really work because the way that she was and it did give off that vibe of like he did something, not like he's possessed. Yeah. And I yeah, have and- to say, too, the casting for this movie, like Patrick Wilson and Ro, like when you watched the first one, it felt cohesive, like the vibes you know, everything. And that poor girl that just, the little baby that cried the whole time. That's what I said in the first one. Like, this baby, she is just crying the whole goddamn time. It's like, I get I get you had yeah. to have like a scare of somebody going to take her, but like, why is she there? Like, yeah. why, why mm-hmm. is the baby here? Mm-hmm. And then There's the poor no baby's on the floor in two. You know what I mean? Like that whole scene, <laughs> I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, that but, was a good scare with that. I, I think my, the shining moment for two of me is, I love that first shot that we get it's almost jump scary, but it's of Josh at the piano, just screaming in the upside or not the upside down, the further um, where you're like you, the whole time leading up to it. You're like, something's weird with Josh. Like we, we kind of know he's possessed. Um, and you hear that song that Renee wrote that's being played on the piano and she goes in and, you know, he kind of shrugs it off. He's like, I don't know your song. I don't know how to play piano or whatever. And then it cuts to the <laughs> blue. She's like, light do you know the this song? He's like, no. <laughs> Yeah. And it cuts no, to the like, blue light of the further and Wilson, Patrick Wilson's just staring, like standing at the piano, screaming to like sort of break through to, to create, that is a cool to, know, scene. to yeah, alert them that movie. it's not him. So mm-hmm. I, I really loved that image. And, that and I really story. liked how they made him like 
look the same, but like you could tell like with his teeth and his skin, he mm-hmm. it reminded me like kind of like the exorcist ask, you know, how she was like slowly progressing and it was like the normal skin color. And then it was that pale, mm-hmm. like yellowish green. Mm-hmm. Kind of like deal. decaying away or like deteriorating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. When he's like shaking yep. his tooth out. Remember yeah, when he's, he's, that? he's, like, he's, he's just dropping he's... teeth all over the floor for Carl to mm-hmm. find. Yes. And then, and then you got Tucker and Specs, and I forgot to like mention them, but they're just, they're some of my favorite horror characters to ever exist. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And like, I wrote down one of the lines when they were talking about the safe word and he's like quesadilla and he's like, how are you going to use that? He's like, it's lunchtime. It's quesadilla time. It's quesadilla time. <laughs> and then okay. Spex was trying to say the safe word should be unicorn. And he's trying to battle that quesadilla wouldn't come up in conversation. It's like, how would unicorn come up? Like, just, mm-hmm. you'll know, you'll know if I'm in trouble. Like, just, mm-hmm. you'll figure yeah, it out. They're like, okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and they're no, that, I, like- I, them as a whole are just amazing. The comic relief didn't like ruin it for me because you know sometimes like horror movies try to be funny, and you're just yes. like, yeah. which no, I then. do not like sometimes, but I think they play well in these movies, definitely. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. I completely. And agree we also that. get the introduction of Carl, who is just another character that I, I love. I think this franchise does the a Dice really Man? good job at <laughs> yes, doing. Dice yeah, Man. I mean, yeah, <laughs> he um he may not have the most like convenient method of of conversing with the other side, but it's pretty I love cool. it. It is um, cool. But and they do a great like job determin- in this franchise for that. Yes, mm-hmm. and you can kind of feel like his determination. Like you know yes. that he like is there and it's just like so sincere. And I I do like the addition of him. And that's that's how you do sequels. That's how you do another movie after is you leave like the main characters, but you just slowly add in like mm-hmm. another factor. You don't just mm-hmm. fucking pile on a whole bunch of stuff and be like, okay, this is this is new. Yep. So but um yeah, yeah. so two is just I I think it's a great one and two, like one and done. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's one of my favorite horror sequels. So it did a very good job of like tying up that Lambert story, you know, to an extent with like, obviously the red door came out and we kind of finally put a complete bow on the, on it. But I, I think chapter two served as like a great sequel, especially leading right from one to the other, because it was a very cliffhanger style ending for one so i i really do enjoy too i love the whole parker crane storyline i know it's i forget how much i like of, it yeah i know it's like a pretty divisive storyline the whole mother forcing the son to be a daughter and he tried to castrate himself so he got thrown in like what uh, the, the whatever but i know it's a little iffy for a storyline but i i liked that whole bait and switch of the fact that they had a male actor playing the bride in black in the first movie. And then they thought to go back and be like, you know what, let's kind of make this storyline somehow converge in this movie. Mm -hmm. And I Mm like that they were like, Oh, it's actually not, you know, a bride in black. You know, it's, it's Parker crane. He's, you know, and then we have the whole hospital scene where she's like, Oh, why is patient, whatever, whatever walking around. She's like, Oh, Parker Crane like jumped oh. off the building a couple of days. She's like so creepy. I loved it. I love that scene too because I, like I when you're too. sitting in the elevator with him or, or with her, and, she, and he's she's like, "What are you doing?" And he's just standing there. And then yeah. when she goes up to the desk, and she's like, "Oh, he died yesterday." Mm-hmm. Which I is like, I, I, I love it. I love it. But then when I take a step back, I'm like, "Wait, that was your patient, and you didn't know that he died a couple days ago. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> yeah, you weren't doing your rounds. Like, like you were just like, some PTO." <laughs> if you pick it, if you pick at things too much, I know you can kind of, you know, mm-hmm. find holes and everything. But I, well, they, I, I mean, like, used to spray. smoke cigarettes in the hospital, so I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it kind right. of makes sense if she doesn't really care about, or doesn't really know too much about a patient because she's probably smoking <laughs> right. like in the ICU. So <laughs> the good old days, you know. Um, but it did make sense that there was a connection between Crane and Josh because I think young Josh did see him. So it does like, okay, yes. I guess it makes a little sense that he found a vulnerable soul or whatever to kind of go after. So, but one and, and two definitely kind of tie up. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the, the thing too, that makes insidious so creepy is it's like, they're literally trying to feast on like people and, and just have this like evil malevolent presence. And I don't know, it's just, it's so simplistic, but the little twist and then adding depth to the storyline makes it work. Mm-hmm. But then like as we get further in the franchise, I kind of like they're enjoyable. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I think Insidious as a whole isn't like one of the worst franchises. I think it's one of the stronger ones if mm-hmm. for like rewatchability or watchability. But I'm I'm I definitely champion I this franchise. I like this one mm-hmm. a lot. And the last I thing so. I, I know I'm rambling, but the last thing I want to say with the, no, with the okay. whole 
uh, the the scene with the girl boy, it felt like sleepaway camp to me, like that kind yeah. of, you know. And I and I, I I know what you're saying, but I thought it was done like in a tasteful way, mm-hmm. if that's yeah. if that's possible. And I just felt yeah. like that kind of worked. Like maybe in other things it wouldn't have, but in this story, I think it it was yeah. okay. I, I liked it. I just the only confusing part for me was I, I really wanted to find the mother's like what was making her tick and go that way. Like we're assuming maybe the father left or I I'm just, I I wish we did maybe instead of if they could rework history and do chapter three, kind of dive into like the woman in white. I think she's kind of referred to because she was, you know, a a terrifying character as well. And she's the one Mm kind of slapping, you know, she's bitch slapping people around like it's nobody's business. (laughs) Uh, But I would have liked to have dove into her a little bit more too. Cause like, they refer to what was it Parker Crane as the, the the mother of death or something like the when he rolled the dice it was something like that but you know who's the mother of the mother of death or something like that that would have been a fun little story to kind of go down but I think yeah. that ship has probably sailed I would have been down for that but like you said probably already long gone you can only do so much right um yeah. so yeah so after one and two kind of conclude um, Jamie I'll let you talk about uh, chapter three because this kind mm-hmm. of departs. Uh, from the Lambert storyline, and we're uh, once again graced with the presence of Elise. So how do, how does that happen? <laughs> how again, does this happen? We are. It's a cat. So, She's got nine lives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, pretty much. She must, honestly, and I'm glad because I love her. On five lives already. <laughs> she's, not, no, she's, she's pushing it. She's getting close. But, okay, so Insidious Chapter 3, personally... I think is a very good prequel to this franchise. It takes place three years earlier in 2007, I want to say, from when the uh, Lambert haunting was. So this one follows Quinn Brenner and her father and her brother, Alex. Quinn meets up with Elise, who she gets her information as her being a retired demonologist. Quinn had lost her mom a year prior to all this happening. She wanted to try and contact her mom. She finds Elise. She tells her she doesn't really deal with this kind of stuff anymore. She tells her, she's like, I really want to do this. I want to try and contact her, say my goodbyes, all that kind of stuff. She's like, okay, I'll do it. Reluctantly. So, (laughs) (laughs) which for good reasoning, obviously. (laughs) But when she finally gets Quinn to go to her room or no I think Elise with this one um tried to reach out to Quinn's mom by herself when she was in her reading room that's when she opened up her reading room and stuff like that and she was greeted by someone who was definitely not Quinn's mother unfortunately and (laughs) she warns Quinn not to try to contact her mother again she can't do this again because there is definitely a malevolent spirit that is trying to come through and is disguising herself as her mother which is when we so I know we said we weren't going to do too many spoilers, but I feel like this one's kind of hard to do without spoiling. Oh, no, no, you have to spoil everything. Okay, I was this just going to say, if you guys haven't seen it, this one came out in like 2015, so I'm no, just going to spoil it. It's okay. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> but a few days pass by. In Quinn's apartment building that she lives in with her father and her brother, they're pretty close-knit building. She has neighbors, elderly neighbors that live above them or below them, I want to say. But Grace well, is below, an elderly. Who is it below? Above yeah. them is empty. Is the empty one, yes. And Grace, one of the elderly wife that lives underneath with them, um, talks to Quinn, tells her all this crazy kind of stuff. She suffers from dementia, yada, 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 all this kind of things. Tells her things about this evil spirit, essentially, similar to what Elise had told her, to uh, kind of keep away, keep safe, all this kind of stuff. Quinn goes to a audition for a performing art school and she sees an odd figure standing across the street which i love this scene waving to her from across the street and i think it was because i should have rewatched i'm actually rewatching it right now just to try to get (laughs) in the right mindset but i want to say she walked into traffic or she was standing there and just wasn't paying attention and ended up getting hit by the car and ultimately broke both of her legs which is absolutely insane so i feel like this spirit is definitely yeah I was like, I know. I was like, this entity really does not like her. This guy is strong. Yes. So essentially, this is the guy who we become to know as the man who can't breathe, which personally, I think out a lot of the entities and spirits that we've seen in the Insidious franchise, he's super duper creepy. Really Mm. freaks me out. The black tar footprints when he's walking. There was one scene, I don't want to ramble too much either and get off topic, but (laughs) there was one scene in particular where I love so much when Quinn, after she'd already broken her leg, she's in her room 
on the laptop with her friend and she's like, is Alex in the room with you? And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm by myself. And every time I watch that scene, it's just so scary. Mm -hmm. And the man who can't breathe pops up, shuts the blinds, turns the lights off, shuts her laptop, closes the door. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so like, and she's just like sitting there helpless because she broke both her legs. So she can't do anything. That Mm -hmm. scene was so and didn't have to be too scary, didn't have too many jump scenes, just so simplistic enough to where it worked with how it is. But long story short, this spirit attaches himself to Quinn. Quinn tries to get the help of her mother through Elise. Elise tries to help. This is also in the part where Elise meets Tucker and Specs for the first time, since this is a, se- or a prequel, which mm-hmm. then they end up teaming up, all that kind of stuff. And then towards the end of the movie... I want to say is when Elise tells him we should do this another time, blah, blah, blah. And then it's when it would lead into the first Insidious. And I wanted to mention too, when I was rewatching this earlier or when I had it on earlier, I think Elise lived in the house prior to the house that Josh and Renee got. Oh, they they go into her. They go into her. I think so. They go into her history in the fourth one. And she was like, (laughs) as a kid grew up in like New Mexico. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. But overall, the third one essentially follows the different story of the Brenner family before the story of the Lamberts. But this is kind of how Elise got back into the demonology and everything and fighting off the evil spirits. And before we had to see her get killed off. So it was nice hanging over her a lot in this one. <laughs> I know. I love her mm-hmm. as just a character in any movie. I do too. Her, her, her yeah, I- titties hanging out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love I love this movie. I know this one is probably amongst I feel like a lot of most people, like people it. hate on this one a lot just because mm-hmm. maybe it was the departure from the Lamberts or or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But I, I thoroughly enjoy this movie as a standalone. I think it's a good tale. prequel too. Yeah, yeah. It I uses like it. the main like topics of Insidious with the further mm-hmm. and demons and just tells a different tale. Like I think that's fine. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I think that it's if you keep like the further as your pinpoint like your focal point and then just Mm -hmm. add into it i'm down for that because if you have good storytelling which i agree with you guys i think the storytelling's Mm -hmm. great i think the premise of the movie is fantastic i like three yeah i i I really liked it yep and she doesn't and they don't really explore the further as much i think but i do like the parts where they're in the hallway and she's kind of in the further when she's in the hallway trying to escape from them and all that kind of stuff and kind of like goes back and shifts into it so Mm -hmm. i did like that my explaining of things, I did have it all written down, but I try to kind of go off script a little bit, but it's not as great, but. Oh, but I thought it was fantastic. Like it. Me, I was just like. Yeah. I feel like you were like what I do because it's like, no, see, I feel like you're to the point, which is good. But for me, I just feel like I want to write down every single detail and tell you the whole entire movie, but I can't do that. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I, I, like I said, I like this movie. The the tough part for me was this was, <laughs> maybe it's just because now I'm in like the real world. When Quinn is like bitching about her dad so much, like he's like the worst guy in the world. I was like, dude, like he just lost his wife. He's working two jobs. He's trying to support mm-hmm. you and your brother. And you're outside just being like, yeah, my dad fucking sucks. You're like, know, you like it shit. makes me not like you a little bit. So like, it's harder mm-hmm. for me to like fully get on your side. And this mm-hmm. dude's busting his ass for you. And you're just like out there shit talking him with your friend. But, um, but I, I thought that this had a lot go of good ahead. story. I, I thought there was a lot of good scares in this one too. Like you mentioned when he's, she's texting her friend and they're like knocking mm-hmm. on the door or uh, the wall. The in between on the them. wall. It's so good and he's too. like, I'm at, he's like, yeah, I'm out. So <laughs> I'm out, at my grandma's. And, so, and you're like, face. oh, <laughs> you're like, okay, so what's going on there? Um, and the whole like kind of teleporting her from the floor up to the abandoned apartment. And they're like, you tell me who did this because I'm not paying because their whole ceiling like broke off and they Cracked called the landlord and stuff like yeah. that. And he's like, I'm not paying for that. And they go upstairs and they see the, <laughs> the sludgy <laughs> footprints. I was like, okay, this is. Like mm-hmm. I, I like this. It's it's a cool way to adapt this story and move past the Lamberts. Mm-hmm. The landlord's like, damn, I guess someone must have been up here, huh? <laughs> After he saw those footprints. <laughs> and I and yep. I can't remember if this is three or four because I I do confuse like the Elise storylines. But um, if it's not in the third one, I'll use this as my segue to the fourth one, and we'll get to it. But I. There's two parts I can't remember if it was in either. It's the one where she's having the conversation with her husband, like where she's laid. I think it's this one where she lays down her the cardigan, his her cardigan at the end. And it's this one, yeah. Yeah. 
So mm-hmm. she has that good. Yeah, it is this one. Okay. So she has this conversation. She sees one. her husband and they have this conversation. And it ends with him being like, well, and then you, it have to kill you. you have to kill yourself. And, mm-hmm. and she's like, and she's like, he would never, you know, my Thomas would never ask me to do that mm-hmm. demon or whatever. And then the man who can't breathe is finally revealed. And, you know, you get the whole, I'm stronger. And she, blasts him with her you know further power or whatever it is but i thought that was a good like little tie into her backstory because she was in a vulnerable place she had left that that job or whatever and it's just a nice little touch on her story because we don't get much about her really in the first two movies other than this is her occupation and this is what she does we don't know about her life and finding this point to introduce um, Specs and Tucker was a good point, like a good moment mm-hmm. to introduce them. Cause I think it was the, the brother of Quinn that like followed them on YouTube, the spectral sightings. Yes. And that's how they mm-hmm. kind of connected the dots with everybody. Um, like the one part was the brother was in, in the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he the was one, like yeah, never in it. I don't yeah. know, like what all this is going on. Day. I think he was at like his friends for most of the time or something. I do remember them mentioning that. He was like, oh, I would be at my friends. Those. I, I would just yeah, say, I, would I don't yeah. blame him because I'd be like, fuck this shit. Yeah. My yeah. sister's got two broken legs and there's a ghost haunting her. I'm out. Like, and then no she ends chance. up like torquing her neck. So she's literally like in a neck brace, like two broken yeah. legs, like, and then just fucking snaps them off when she's possessed. And they're like, damn, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> they're she like, had- holy shit. <laughs> She had a rough go at things for sure. She had a yeah. rough go, but it's her dad's fault. Um, so whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> let's uh, say we'll segue into the uh, the fourth installment of the franchise, Insidious: The Last Key. Uh, now, this one is a in betweener. This is a sequel to Chapter Three and a prequel to the very first Insidious, mm-hmm. um, and it takes place in 2010. So, like, it leads directly at the end of this directly into the Lambert story. It's Insidious One. Um, this one does like use flashback methods a lot because it goes even deeper into Elisa's story, uh, more, more so her as a child and her father and what all that is, but it goes between the 1953 and present day 2010. So the kind of the, the creature, the entity in this one is, the um, key face, which is, mm-hmm. I thought a really cool design. Same. He is like he does what everything else does. They manipulate, they control the victims. And then this one kind of takes a little bit step further into the supernatural aspect where he has the ability to use his key fingers and shut off your vocals. So nobody can really hear you scream. Um, This is kind of the origin of Elise finding her powers. She, as a kid is claiming to see ghosts and her father is just not having it. He's, you know, beating her, locking her in the basement and in the basement, the key face kind of, she opens the door, so to speak. And key face comes in, kills her mother and drops her while she's in a phase. And you know, the father loses her shit. Um, we find out later that the one time that we think it is a ghost, it's not. So there was a, actually a girl locked in their basement. And by the father's doing, because the father at this point has been possessed. Now, this one was just a really cool bait and switch that I didn't even really see coming. But you don't see a figure. Elise is talking to somebody. She says that there's somebody in the closet and the father goes in there, says nobody's in there. And then she runs away. That's when Elise kind of leaves the family, leaves the brother and all that. And come to find out towards the end, that was actually a person. Because what this demon does is takes over the body of its host and it captures females and locks them in the basement. So the present day story is that Elise gets a call from somebody living in her old house. So she goes to kind of check it out. That's what was wrong. Rolls. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. while in town, she stumbles upon her estranged brother and her two nieces who come to find out also have the ability to kind of travel and have that psychic ability. So we, we are back there. The, the guy that is, in the house now is just claiming to see ghosts and all that. But we learned that he was actually possessed and they find a female that's under his control or in the captive area. So they release him, they get that all sorted out and they kind of have to go face the key face demon because one of the nieces gets locked into the trans and one of the other nieces stays with Elise to go to the further and battle this key face demon. And 
during the climax of this, we we get an image of which I think they did this in three as well. So when I saw it in the fourth one, I was kind of like, eh. uh, but Elise's mother shows up to protect Elise and banish the key face monster. And she kind of comes to the realization that although her father, her childhood was like terrible, it it really wasn't his doing. It was that key face demon. So I, I thought that this was a, a good little exploration even deeper into the story of Elise. I, I enjoyed this one a lot. Um, but what did you guys think about the, the last key? I feel like this is the one I've watched least out of all of them, to be honest. But I do like this one. Like you said, I really like the character design of him. And I love getting to know more of the backstory with Elise. And that's the scene I was thinking of when she realizes the house that she lives or, or that she lived in before or her brother and stuff like that. That's what I was thinking of. But mm-hmm. I do like this one as a whole. And I do that scene that I walked in the room when you were watching it the other day, the scene where she's in the basement. And they realize like it's an actual person. I forgot about that, too. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's just such a cool, like, little twist. It and is. I feel like you don't really get as many twists kind of like that in the insidious film. So I thought that was cool. It it was nice to have like, cause you would think there wouldn't be any more twist within like the start of the franchise, but then throwing Mm -hmm. in one that works. It's like, it shows Mm -hmm. masterclass on creating stories. So Mm -hmm. I like, I feel like it was very different from the other ones too. It was an as a whole, I guess (laughs) it took like a lot. (laughs) I know I was waiting for mine too. Cause he was down here. I I I said, I'm like, just don't even do it. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah um, it is it definitely is a departure of the other three yeah and it's it's different but that's it, a good word for it mm-hmm. yeah and it's hard like when we were when we were discussing like that we we're doing the ranking i'm like man this this is difficult because i like i pretty much like all the stories it's just like at what level do i enjoy them and like how many times would i watch them and like you said yes. James, like this is one i i've watched the least but i think mm-hmm. it's a solid story i think it's it, it delivers it does for sure mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. So after after this, they realized, wait, we should probably go back to the Lambert family. They were kind of our money makers. So yeah, people like them. <laughs> enter Insidious the Red Door, our fifth installment in this franchise. This is actually, I think, it, I don't know if it was his directorial debut, but Patrick Wilson also directed this film. Oh, yeah. He this did. picks up. That. Yeah. This takes place nine years after chapter two, and it it's pretty cool that they kept all the same actors. These are the same mm-hmm. child actors, which I don't mm-hmm. know if this kid's in anything else or if he just came back because it like made Dalton. too much sense. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I, for what it is, I mean, he did a very good job in it. Um, mm-hmm. So this is just kind of a weird story. So Dalton is going to college now at this point. And the last time we saw them, they had their memories wiped. Everything was back to normal. You know, Dalton was just in a coma and, they kind of left it at that. And, you know, they don't remember the hauntings. They don't remember Josh trying to kill the whole family with the baseball bat, which Renee so bluntly puts it in this movie. But there's definitely a divide. And we see that right from the get go. We're at Lorraine's funeral. So Josh's mother has just passed and Josh is going through it. They're they're now divorced. Uh, he's living alone. He's kind of getting this midlife crisis almost that he's kind of his memory's shot. He's not remembering stuff and and things just aren't adding up. And his and Dalton's relationship is, is completely fractured. So he's, he drops him off to college and they both run these parallel storylines, which is really cool. Although being apart, Josh is going through the motions of trying to figure out what's wrong. He's getting um, MRIs done to figure out if there's anything wrong with his brain and there's nothing wrong. And they kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, he's under a lot of stress. His, his, family life is in shambles. His mother just passed, you know, that's a lot of emotions to handle. So it's kind of a a normal thing to be going through. Whereas Dalton, he's going to college, he's taking arts class and he's, he's painting and he's getting really into his paintwork and his art teacher should be a psychic because the way she really is the one that kind of fucked everything up for everybody really. Um, Cause she's like, you know, I'm going to count down from 10 and you're going to go further into your paintings and you know it's he starts drawing you know black 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 and he comes across this drawing he he just feels he he gravitates towards this red door and he doesn't know what that means um and he has a roommate he starts explaining they, they get into this conversation of like you know what's weird stuff about you and he comes up and he's like well i was in a coma for a couple months what like that doesn't just happen like <laughs> He's, I think he had I think he said he had meningitis or something like that and it's like no yes. like that's not 
that doesn't just have it's weird to me that you never questioned it up until this point when you're like completely random roommate asks you yeah. <laughs> doesn't he say he's like i don't remember like the whole year i was 10 years old yes, yeah he he's like say i just that. woke up and i was I, I just had to go to school like, or something okay. and it's like okay sure yeah. um but now that the the cracks are starting to appear this is what we've learned that with the fur they're like when the doors open just a little bit they can kind of creak through and start to feed on what they hope to be their host so you know josh is doing his thing and he is doing this little flip card game, which we get a really cool scare of uh, this figure walking closer and closer every time it lifts up a, a picture to work as like a memory game. Um, and he gets like attacked and he comes to find out that that figure was his father. And he, he goes down this rabbit hole of tracking down where his father was. He, he killed himself in an insane asylum. He was put there because of, I think it even said in the notes, you know, he was claiming astral projection, which I don't know if it was a term then, but sure. Um, because we learned in Insidious 1 that this does get passed down, apparently. Mm -hmm. So it is interesting that when they learned that, they never thought to be like, oh, well, then if I, I clearly wasn't just born with it, so my father must have had you know, something like that. But right. um, they go through all these just crazy things. They're, the, the ghosts and the demons are, are slowly creeping in. And we find that that red lipstick demon is is back. He's kind of just been waiting for Dalton to fuck up this whole time in his life. So, like I said, they're running these parallel lines. Josh is finally having this conversation with Renee, and she tells him, like, we wiped your memory. Like, this is, you know, everybody thought this was the right thing to do, including you. And, mm -hmm. like, the <laughs> fact that we're divorced now... The fact that you tried to murder us with a baseball bat, like, I know it wasn't you, but I can't explain that to the children. And all they can remember is seeing their father come at them with a baseball bat. So, like, mm. that's why I kind of pulled away a little bit. And then Dalton is slowly messing around with this stuff, like, more and more and more. And he, as he's falling asleep, he kind of ventures off into the further and gets stuck in the lipstick demon's lair. And he finally does take control of him. So at that moment, he takes control of him. His, his college roommates kind of <clears throat> at this point really screwed because Jamie was freaking out at this scene again too. But the scene where he's like, she's plugging oh. in the lights and he's, yes. you know, he's visually there. And then she unplugs it, plugs him back in. He's there. And she does it the third time. And he's like demon face. Now <laughs> something, something goes up there. And, that's when he goes into the actual further. Josh goes into the further to find him and breaks him free from the lipstick demons layer. They run out They're They're running away from him. They trap him behind the door and Josh stays behind to hold the door shut. So Dalton can get out. I don't know how Dalton put two and two together, but he goes back to the painting in real life of the red door painted black and kind of presumably locks away the demon for good. They both kind of retreat from the further and all's well and good in the Lambert family finally. So I, I, I enjoyed this entry into the franchise. I thought it was, I didn't know if we needed to like reopen that door and button it back up again. Cause it seemed like chapter two sort of did a pretty good job of closing their storyline. But I, I thought that there was a lot of cool tricks in this one. Patrick Wilson, you know, throughout the whole franchise is just, you know, just throwing a hundred miles an hour. He's just, awesome in all of these scenes um yes, and he yes. did a really good job directing this i think he picked up what juan started and concluded it up to this point in a very good way but the red door was this like did you expect it to hold up the standards of the first one or did you were you let down like where were you on the red door i felt like i wasn't my expectations i didn't want them to be too high i was just happy that we had like another installment and i was happy that we had the original cast back because it's cool to see like a full cir circle moment with Dalton, you know, being uh, a college student. And then like, I thought it was cool that they had them divorced. I know that seems like super weird to say, but I like that they had that dynamic because we saw them as a family. We saw them happy and you just think yeah. that that's how it's going to end. And then we get this situation where they're divorced. And like you said, like, I can't explain to the kids why you try to kill us with a baseball bat. And that's a yeah, right. pretty fucking good yeah. excuse. So yeah. Yeah. No, it is good because it does add to that vulnerability state where mm -hmm. that's why they're going to kind of attack him essentially or leech on to him. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought it was a good way because you're right. Like we thought 
at the end of two, like, okay, and they're off and they're good. And this is just going to be a distant memory. They washed kind of their memories of most of the bad and the whole coma stays like state and, you know, they're off and running. But Jamie, what do you think about the red door? I really like this one. We had seen, uh, seen it in the theater originally, and I was kind of iffy about my first time watching it. But then after a couple more watches, when they put it on Netflix and stuff like that, we started watching it more and then preparing for the episode. I really enjoy it. I think like mm-hmm. you guys both said, too, I think Patrick Wilson definitely kind of like kept the persona of Insidious itself and how it was and kind of kept that edge that it has with the jump scares and with the different like simplicity in it like the mri when he's getting the mri done and then the guy you think he's gonna be at the bottom of his feet and then he pops out from the back of him that was a good scene um (laughs) the definitely the scene before the dog started barking and interrupted me when (laughs) sam his roommate dalton's roommate is plugging in the lights and then not even only his face like going like to the demon face but like just like progressively like starts to lose his like facial features and it's just like a grayed out face and it's so creepy and it's ah, i just love it (laughs) every time i watch it it's so good Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's really good Mm -hmm. but there's just a lot of good memorable scenes in this one which i feel like is how i always interpret and always see the insidious films too like in the first one the like you said the red lipstick demon behind patrick wilson when he's sitting in the kitchen or in the living room scene or the little british boy dancing to tiptoe for the tulips in the first Mm -hmm. movie i mean that's just one of those like scenes in horror i feel like will just like live on forever and it's just another daylight scene which they use a lot of those in insidious Mm -hmm. too which i've always liked because horror can still be effective during the day and they prove it with this kind of stuff so i thought the red door was a good a good sign off for insidious if we end up not seeing any more after this (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what else they could really do. So I'm pretty sure they're coming out with more. I I was gonna say, but I wouldn't be surprised. (laughs) I can imagine that they are not gonna let this franchise go because it is Mm -hmm. a moneymaker. You know, they can make horror for cheap, and if people are in the seats, it's pretty easy to recoup that. So, Mm -hmm. um, I I guess it's a good segue to start getting into our ratings of these movies because I'm curious where these all land. It was a very this was tricky, like putting them all against each other because I do really enjoy a lot of these. So. I guess we'll, Jamie, you can kick us off then. We'll start with our five and we'll kind of round table this. So Jamie, what's your, your fifth movie in this franchise? Probably the last key. <laughs> the last key. Okay. Yeah. The one, I feel the like one you just, picked. I didn't pick the last key. I picked insidious chapter three. Oh yeah. Sorry. The one that I picked. You had the last key. <laughs> the one that you picked silly. I was like, shit, did I pick that one? Cause I definitely read off the wrong script. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got my rankings in front of me and I'm they're all over the no. place. No. Yeah, but not even because I think it's bad or I don't think it's did what it's supposed to do. I just feel like I don't go back to it as much as I do with the other ones and don't get as mm-hmm. much out of this as I do with the others. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So Jordana, what's at the bottom of your insidious list? Not that the bottom is a bad place to be with these movies no. because it's <laughs> they're all pretty close for me. Yeah, and it was hard to do this because I I don't want to like label it as like my least favorite because I like them all, but right. like I will say I'm with Jamie. I'm gonna put the last key mm-hmm. as five just because mm. there was other points that had the other ones above it, but I still really like that movie as it's as a whole. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was, it something was just had to be there. Yep. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. something just that's, had to that's be all there. All it is. <laughs> So for my number five, I'm going to shake it up a little bit. My number five is actually Insidious the Red Door, the newest one. Really? Yeah. I um I just think they did a couple new fun things, but it was very similar. This is kind of the first time that we did go back to the same antagonist. You know, I, I that was a part of the franchise that I really enjoyed is we always get these new, elaborate, different entities and this one is like, okay, yeah, we're going back to the lipstick demon. Like, I like him and it's cool. Um, but I just, I felt a little bit, again, it kind of had a lot of convenience in it, which mm-hmm. like, I, how did they just all of a sudden both click and be like, start remembering? And, you know, because Dalton was painting a picture, that's kind of what opened the door again for him. But there's a lot of good stuff in this movie. I do like this movie a lot, but I think because my expectations of this franchise of seeing new things and Mm -hmm. it kind of stepped backwards um, and retold a story that it's cool to do with all the actors and like catching up with them current day. I didn't feel was completely necessary, but Mm -hmm. 
but I do, like you mentioned, I love the whole fact of the divorce and their story, I guess, wasn't done, but you know, we had to rehash it a little bit. So there was a lot of good stuff, but for me, I just had to put it at number five, but uh, Jamie, you're number four. So to kind of piggyback off you, I have the red door at number four. <laughs> mm, okay. I do. So again, not because I didn't like it or anything like that. I just feel like, and of course it's the first three original in the franchise to be up in the top three, but I just feel like they're, they're, they just live up to what they are. But I feel like the only thing that the red door, you made a really good point. I didn't even think about that before making my rankings, but I feel like that maybe kind of contributed as to why I didn't connect with it as much maybe as the others, because we have seen the lipstick demon before and stuff like that. But I do enjoy about this one a lot is that we get to see more into like his lair and like Mm. his, where he lives and kind of stuff like that. And we get those really like close up detailed, like image shots of him, like scratching at his skin with like long fingernails and like the hair just like sticking out. He looks so creepy. I do like it. (laughs) He's, he's terrifying. Mm -hmm. I do like that. We got some more imagery of him, um, whether that's good or bad, because it kind of defeats the purpose, right? Like where the the less you see it, the more scared you are of it because your imagination just runs rampant. Uh, but I, I feel like they also didn't do over the top, like showcasing him. I thought it was done well enough that you got to see just enough more, but still very, very terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so not like overkill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Jordana, you're number four. Oh, this was hard. I like went back and forth with it, but I'm putting three at four just because okay. I, I really liked, I really enjoyed three. I did, mm-hmm. but there was something about, and I'll you know touch on it when I, you know, talk about the, the uh, red door, but like, there's just something about three that I enjoyed, but other ones I would watch again. And mm-hmm. there was other parts that really, did it for me not saying that three didn't do it for me but yeah unfortunately yeah, the other ones just have more yeah mm-hmm. exactly so that's why it's in four yeah well i'm gonna follow you and my number four is also insidious three mm-hmm. i i do enjoy this one but like what i mentioned with the quinn i, I felt like we had a, a weak protagonist in this one a little bit um i liked the man that can't breathe but it just get a little it was coming off the first two it was just not completely up to par. I felt like they fell into the horror tropes that one and two avoided so smartly. Like what you mentioned, the Quinn getting smashed by a car, like (laughs) that felt like such a random jump scare versus like, versus like the well manufactured ones that one and two gave us, you know, with, you know, we, we mentioned the lipstick demon obviously popping out Josh, but the other aspect with like the little boy, that whole little boy sequence where she walks right past him and he's just standing against the wall. And like the laundry room. Ugh, like, so good. Yes. Those yes. subtle jump scares that like don't use crazy sounds to get you mm-hmm. like work for me more. You know, it's she walks past him and the record stops and she goes outside to do the trash and you see him like dancing around and then you, you go into the room and he's gone and like all that worked so it was so eerie for me. And then in three, I felt like we just did the cheap jump scares. You know, the, the man who can't breathe that comes up from the window and pulls Quinn out. And it, it's it was effective, but I think just wasn't executed as as brilliantly as the one and two ones were. So that's why it lands at three. I, I really like three. But again, like we said, something's got to be there. So, Jamie, up to your number three. So this is hard. I think I was going to switch around my rankings a little bit, but I'm going to keep it at what it is just because I think (laughs) this is good. So for number three, I'm going to actually put Insidious Chapter 2. Okay. Insidious 2. So That's a a take. It is a take. And (laughs) as I said with all the other ones too, I just say I don't want to bash on any of these movies because honestly, I do like them all. I feel like... Once I do rewatch in, um, Insidious 2, kind of similar with uh, The Last Key, I haven't really rewatched this as many times as I'd like to, but every time that I do, I always like forget how much I really enjoyed it. And I think there's a lot of good memorable scenes. One of my favorite scenes in this one is when the little when <laughs> Specs and Tucker walk into the room and the little girl is sitting on the bed and she's yes. like, you guys can't be in here. Mother's going to be mad. And they're like, 
okay and they leave it's like that is like that is one of the smartest moves i've ever seen in a horror movie in my life and i love it i'm like they were thinking right i'd be like all right gotta go i guess yeah the door we go is absolutely there (laughs) there is a lot of good character development in that movie and i think there is a lot of good jump scares there is a lot of memorable scenes and the storyline is good too and especially coming after the first one i think it was a good placement for it in the franchise but i feel like the other two i just enjoy a little bit more above this one Mm -hmm. all right so jordana you're number three okay well this was very difficult but i feel like this one was like the one that i knew was going to be in like the middle to kind Mm -hmm. of like separate but i'm going with Mm -hmm. red door i really liked the red door Uh, It was fun to be able to like see return, like we talked about returning characters to get, I, I, it's, it's weird. I love that they were divorced. I just like how they did that. It wasn't like this Mm -hmm. happy go lucky story. Like this is real. It seemed real life. It's not a happy ending. It did. Yes. You know, and I can appreciate that they changed it up in that sense. Um, The MRI scene is memorable. Just, I don't know. And I thought a little touch of nostalgic, like this, Mm -hmm. you know, it's weird because I love Insidious. Insidious is such mm-hmm. an important movie to me. So I think that kind of gave me the warm fuzzies and I was happy that it was back. So mm-hmm. it's going yeah. at number three. So for my number three, I have Insidious The Last Key. That's where I put that one. Um, <laughs> I, I really like this one a lot. I think that the effects they use with the key face, I love the little sparks that come off the keys. It's like electrical almost. Um, I like that bait and switch between... Like, you know, we think the house is possessed and then it's the guy that's possessed. And then we think that there's ghosts in the basement. Oh, wait, they're not ghosts. They're real people. And then it kind of clicks full circle with Elise that like, oh, shit, I could have helped her. Like, that wasn't a ghost when I saw her as a child. Um, And then diving into Elise's backstory, I really appreciated that because it's just she's such an important character in this franchise, even though. She, you know, bit the dust at the first movie and still <laughs> the first came back movie. swinging. <laughs> no. um, but the fact that they kind of tied her story up a little bit even more, you know, they they alluded to how she would die. It was either in this one or the third one, but they showed the the bride in black always waiting for her. I think it might have been the third one, but mm-hmm. they showed you know her being strangled. Yeah. And that's like why that was why she didn't want to help Quinn because she kept every time she'd go into the further the bride in black was waiting for her mm-hmm. i think kind of a vendetta against her for kicking her out of josh as a kid but I, I i appreciate this deep dive into elise because i think she is a very important character in all horror zeitgeist now at this point because she's you know whether you like it or not insidious is a franchise with a name in the horror game and she's one of the biggest factors if not the biggest factor in that maybe next to james wan but it's just I enjoyed this movie a lot. So mm-hmm. let's let's get to where it gets tricky. Jamie, you're number two. Hmm. So my number two, this was tough, but my number two is going to be Insidious Chapter 3. Yeah. Okay. Can't let it take my top spot, but I really enjoy this one. And I know I feel like I tend to like, especially in franchises and stuff like that, Some of the ones that really aren't as popular or aren't as Mm -hmm. well sought out. But I really enjoyed this one. I don't know what it is about it. I feel like I've gone and caught myself rewatching this one as many times as I've watched the original Insidious. And I feel like it still has the nods to Insidious, the films itself and the franchise. But I feel like it's so different, even though I know it's supposed to be a prequel and all that kind of stuff. But I feel like it's just different enough that sometimes it does feel like a different movie to me, but in like a good way, if that makes sense. Yes. I feel like it kind of doesn't follow that whole storyline. I feel like when I think Insidious, I immediately think of the Lipstick Demon, those kind of like main characters. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that it followed a different family, had the different storyline, stuff like that. So I thought it was really interesting. Even though, Nick, you don't like the cheap jump scares, I love the fucking cheap jump scares. And they get me every time when she got (laughs) pulled out, almost pulled out the window. I did think it was silly that her dad was like, you know what? I'll let her check it out, checking out the window like what do you think was gonna happen (laughs) and then the only thing that really got me was that the fact that like the dad definitely like saw this guy and like all these people were like definitely saw him but like that's when you like finally decided you're like man maybe we should do something about this like not after leave my daughter like randomly got hit by a car broke both her legs and like got slammed around in her room like i've seen this guy now we're good <laughs> now we're gonna yeah. get him <laughs> like that's the deciding factor right <laughs> but overall i did really enjoy this one 
Yeah, and that's it is nice. Number two. Yeah, it is nice when these franchises, you know, for better or for worse, do depart from their mm-hmm. full on storylines a little bit. It, it it almost breathes like fresh air into the franchise because then you mm-hmm. can, you know, if I watch Insidious one, there's no way I'm not watching Insidious two. But if you exactly. just pick up like Insidious three, you're like, okay, I can just you know jump you in. Just and watch it by standalone. Yeah. Yeah, and you might have the urge to watch one and then two because it's that's the order that it or. Mm-hmm. Three, four, one, two, whatever way it actually yeah. goes, but you don't you don't necessarily feel like you have to watch the other ones after seeing this one. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, Jordana, you're number two. <sighs> this is so hard because, like, <laughs> I am usually the sequels, not like usually, but for like Halloween two, Scream two, they're above mm-hmm. just because there's so much fun to watch, and I also enjoy yep. like in two how they showed parts of one, like Josh was watching the big guy like walking the porch you know what i mean mm-hmm. like that whole that, sequence chef's kiss love that. right i do love that part of that i forgot about that almost that is mm, so good <laughs> yes so with that being said i'm gonna put and this hurts my heart but i have to stay true to my heart i'm putting insidious at two okay nice. 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 Two. okay yes. mm-hmm. and insidious for me again like i touched on it in the beginning it was such a great change of pace in the paranormal Mm -hmm. realm and having Mm -hmm. you know jump scares and and stuff like that in broad daylight is what i want because that shit can happen all the time and i want Mm -hmm. you know not depending on dark jump scares i want it to be right in my face so i don't know one is iconic so um yeah it's going at number two well, I'm going to piggyback you because I thought I was going to shock the world, but I also have Insidious <laughs> at number two, the original. I do. Um, I thought those tricks that they pulled off in this, you know, we talk about the horror tropes, especially when you're talking about, you know, haunted house movies where you're like, bitch, move. OK, well, they did and it didn't work. So, like, I appreciate that they took those moments into consideration and we're like, no, we're going to flip the script a little bit like. This is not full on poltergeist remake. This is, you know, there's layers to this one. We we have this whole other world. And I, I, I for what Insidious did, I, I love it. But mm-hmm. I, there are parts that I, you know, obviously I kind of showed my hand by knowing now what's that number one. But I think that <laughs> it just left some doors open for us and they kind of answered it in a smart way in two. Um, but you can't say enough good about the first Insidious with how they worked these scares and the storyline. And it was just, it truly was a masterpiece. But I, mm-hmm. the biggest thing that I took away from this movie was the fact that they, they knew the tropes and they were like, all right, we're going to, you know, we're going to address that head on. We're going to swap it and we're going to tell you why it wasn't the house. So I thought that was a really, really smart move. So Jamie, you know, obviously by, um, Knowing the previous four, we can kind of, you know, re- uh, guess what's number one. But why don't you talk about your number one and explain why it's there? So my number one is going to be the OG Insidious mm-hmm. in the franchise. And I feel mm-hmm. like what really did it for me with this one, because I kind of it was tough for me with going between three and one for my top spot, because I do really enjoy both. I feel like it's more so the nostalgia factor of this one for me. Just mm-hmm. seeing insidious for the first time it came out in what 2011 i think mm-hmm. yeah. is when it's it came out i think I would say. Like so that. being how old was i maybe 13 14 pretty young so <laughs> i was like i know <laughs> but seeing this as a 13 14 how old i was in that range i was like damn like this is pretty scary and like seeing it now that i'm older almost 12 13 years later i just think it's so crazy that it's just held up so well yeah. and for instance, like the scene we've already mentioned it before with the boy in the window just dancing to tiptoe through the tulips, like that song in Tiny Tim, like has just skyrocketed from that. And I feel like it's such an iconic like horror song that just could be anytime you hear it. Like, and I feel like Insidious is one of those movies, specifically the first one, that even if you're not as big into horror as like we are, or, like some other people are, I feel like the Insidious films, or at least the first one, are definitely ones like people have seen before. Like, especially asking yeah. people, they're like, oh, I don't really watch scary movies, but I've seen Insidious or I've seen Jaws or whatever, stuff like that. So I feel like it definitely falls into that category where it's very likable by others as well, which yes. I like too. But just Insidious did something for the for the new age horror world in those mid-2000s. And I feel like it was definitely one of those coming out with 
this when Sinister came out kind of It Follows came out a couple of years later I feel like all that new age horror this was definitely in that realm and it will always hold up for me it, yeah, it definitely well, I mean, like was the movement that started mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm, like yep. the new horror yep. that we got definitely and, Real quick, just to throw this one in, because we did not even touch on it. I don't even know how we missed this scene. Mm-hmm. But remember the baby monitor scene? Oh, yeah. Like yeah. that that whole that whole I part. Where, wow. Yeah. And wow. he's like, I want it. I want it. Yeah. So it was scary. So- that guy, we better yeah. see him in the house is what I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm Especially the scene with him behind the bassinet. Eek. Yes. I hope so. If, if we don't, I will yeah, be I mean, extremely I- sad, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, Insidious definitely walked so The Conjuring could run. You know, this definitely kickstarted Hell this yes. new, and you can see with James Wan and Patrick Wilson being involved with both, you can see instances that they pulled direct from Insidious for The Conjuring, especially both being that haunted housey style movie. So, um, Jordana, me and you are on the same page, but yes, you know, yeah. you're number one. Let's officially say it. Insidious too, of course. The sequel yep. has to be up on top. I just love. I loved what they did with it. I loved that it felt a little bit darker. You know what I mean? Because like the first one was dark and it was scary. It was effective. I felt like they definitely amped it up in this one. And I again, I'm a sucker for incorporating the core story and having scenes from the previous movie in that one because you kind of feel like you're watching both. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like you're, you're putting yourself into that that realm. But I just. Patrick Wilson, again, being as nasty and evil and malevolent as he was <laughs> and just the imagery and I don't know, it's 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 top of the list for me. Yeah, and a lot of your same points, that's why at number one, I also have uh, Insidious Chapter 2. I thought the tricks that they pulled to tie in the first movie was brilliant. The whole, how you know, it's not really a house invasion, but like when the door is opening and the alarm's going off and come to find out it was Josh, like trying God, to open the door part. and get to like, yes. it was such a smart thing that when you're watching it in insidious one, you're not necessarily thinking like, huh, I wonder what opened the door. I mean, like to an extent, but you don't dive that deep into it or for them no. to revisit that in chapter two and be like, Oh, it was Josh in the further the whole time. Like he was trying to warn them. He was trying to get mm-hmm. the fan. Like he knew what was happening. And I just, I loved that. And like I said, um, I believe it was in this one that we talked about earlier when you get that first initial shot of Josh when he's screaming at the piano. Like I yes. that is up there for me versus lipstick face demon jump scare in one because it's just so it is a really cool shot. Such mm-hmm. such an aha moment and a beautiful shot. And it's a great way to actually like differentiate the worlds where you're like, okay, like I thought that's what was happening to him, but like for sure this is what's happening to him. And I yeah. love Carl. I I really I Carl got bonus points on this one for me because I, or the movie got bonus points because Carl was included. I really love his his inclusion. Mm-hmm. I thought that having him be also a psychic, but using the dice, like a, a completely different method. Um, yeah. But they both work one in the same. And I thought that whole Parker Crane storyline, I, I did like it. I love the whole Bride in Black. I think that that's a pretty yes. terrifying villain mm-hmm. up there with lipstick demon face man guy, whatever it is. But um, I, I, I loved that. And it, I, I did like that they were, again, kind of like Red Door. This one, they were almost split storylines. You had like Tucker and Specs and Lorraine and Carl kind of doing their thing. And then you had the Lamberts doing their thing. And it was just kind of a collision course for, at the ending. So I, I really enjoyed that. I I couldn't, you know, I, I was very close. But when a sequel comes around and they don't completely drop the ball, it's almost bonus points again. Like, yes, they did it well. So mm-hmm. it, it's at number one for me. So, yes. Yeah. So that is the Insidious franchise as a whole. Ooh. We talked about it all. So yes. if you have not seen these movies yet and you listen Please to this episode, watch. you're, you're yeah, crazy that right uh, you got <laughs> super spoiled. But definitely give these a watch before Horror Nights comes around because with it being Insidious the further, we can only assume that the majority, if not all of these villains will be somewhere in this house. We can only mm-hmm. assume. So, oh, um, I know. Yeah, I, I'm excited for that. But again, before we sign off, Jordana, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. I know mm-hmm. Insidious is a, is a franchise that is near and dear to your heart. So I'm glad we could incorporate you onto something that you're actually like, I'm interested in this. We can actually talk about right. Insidious. Well, I'm so happy um, that you guys had me on. I'm glad that we got to connect finally. And I hope I know. this isn't the last time that we get to hang and do this. So. No, it won't yes. be. Yes. Meeting online friends in real life and with Horror Nights coming up too. So 
Yes, if, we, will, if we don't see you before, we'll see you oh in the fall yes. for sure. That would yes. be amazing. That would make my day. Yes. We'll, we'll definitely make that happen. So uh, before we sign off, why don't we just bookend this again, Jordana, with you. Just just let everybody know where to find you at um, so they can kind of be up to date with all your awesome stuff you put out. Well, thank you. Well, you can find me, Pretty Killer Podcast, on Instagram, all the platforms, TikTok, X, YouTube. Um, and then you can find me in the Core 4 Pod and you can find me on Future Creatures DTF. Same as Pretty Killer Podcast. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, when we sign off, we typically do our name. So I'll, I'll let you take, um, I'll, Jamie, you'll go after me and Jordana. You can follow us up and in, including all this. So, um, But until next time, this is Nick. This is Jamie. This is Jordana. Happy <laughs> haunts. She nailed it. Cursed. 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 You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's a type of one. And again, I would just like to thank Vampire Stepdad for letting us use his music for our intro and outro music. So if you would, just go check him out, Spotify, Facebook. Again, that is Vampire Stepdad.